in the newly created Reich industry flourished as never before. The merchant fleet grew larger every day. German harbors were jammed with commerce and German stomachs filled with beer and sausage. Germany had achieved unity, become rich, no other country threatened her. The world hoped for a peaceful good neighbor. But the world had forgotten the Prussian tradition that Germany had inherited. A tradition not of peace and friendship, but of war and conquest. And by now, Karl Schmidt of the second generation, the father of the Karl Schmidt we had to fight, was arrogantly singing Deutschland, Deutschland über alles, Germany, Germany over all, as he proudly watched his fatherland becoming the most aggressively nationalistic country in the world. Industry was carefully controlled to accord with the policies of the great general staff. For in the new Reich, Bismarck had added a fourth pillar to the structure of the warlike state. Frederick's militarists, landowners, and state officials had been joined by the big industrialists. A gigantic railroad system was laid out, more according to strategic war plans than the necessities of peacetime trade. One of the largest navies was constructed. The army was built up to staggering proportions. The German officer was the idol of the nation, the personification of German ambition. In German colleges, the sport of German youth was not football, but the deadly duel. The scar was the badge of honor. The more scars, the handsomer. Did they not prove the man's prowess in arms? And contentedly watching all stood the great general staff, still directed by the Prussian Junkers secure in the knowledge that their power and authority was indisputable. Germany was geared for war. All it needed was a new leader to give the word. And again, that leader was at hand. William II of Hohenzollern, the Kaiser that your father knew. Not a shrewd, clever cynic like Bismarck, but a vain and arrogant braggart, yet a leader in the German tradition. We Germans like to bear arms, and we like the game of war. I shall enlarge your borders. And what did Karl Schmidt's father say to all this? A German spark has always ignited the fire. Soon everything will be aflame. Through one international crisis after the other, the Kaiser rattled his sword loudly demanding Germany's place in the sun. In vain, the other powers proposed an international agreement for general disarmament. But disarmament didn't suit the plans of the German militarists, landowners, state officials, or industrialists. They wanted their own way, and their own way meant war. War, therefore, was inevitable. It only needed an incident. How did this second generation Carl Schmidt react to the prospect of a world war? Berlin took on the air of a carnival. Blindly, joyfully, the people cheered the Kaiser, eager to follow a leader on the renewed march to conquest. Thus, in August of 1914, Karl Schmidt of the 2nd generation, indoctrinated with 150 years of Prussian tradition, marched off to set the world aflame. Had
Had he not been taught, did he not believe that whatever Germany demands is right? Even when he marched through Belgium, dismissing a solemn neutrality pact as a scrap of paper. Even when German scientists developed poison gases in violation of international agreements which Germany had solemnly signed. Even when in violation of all the agreed codes of war, German U-boats deliberately sent to the bottom unarmed merchant ships without warning. Thus, what his father had done to France, to Denmark, to Austria, this second generation Carl Schmidt attempted to do to the world. Our own President Wilson said, I was for a little while unable to believe that such things would in fact be done by any government that had subscribed to the human practices of civilized nations. But only when we realized that we were directly threatened, only when every protest had been ignored and Germany had carried the war right into our home waters, did we feel compelled to fight. Finally, under the combined attack of the Allies, the German army started to crumble, to fall back, to run from battle. Germany was at the mercy of the Allies. General von Ludendorff, the German chief of staff and virtual dictator, was forced to send a secret message to the Berlin government. The offer of peace must be transmitted immediately. The army cannot wait another 48 hours. The Allies could grant the armistice or fight on to unconditional surrender. Georges Clemenceau, the wartime French leader, urged that the Allies should march triumphant into Berlin. Our own General Pershing said, complete victory can only be obtained by continuing the war until we force unconditional surrender. But the world would not listen. So golden was the thought of peace that the armistice was granted. We celebrated. Not only because the war was over, but because it seemed that we had put an end to German militarism forever. Hadn't the German army been beaten? Hadn't the German plan for conquest failed? <laughs> 